Chapter 10. How to Practice Stoicism I am not a wise man, and I will not be one in order to feed your spite. So do not require me to be on a level with the best of men, but merely to be better than the worst. I am satisfied. If every day I take away something from my vices and correct my faults, I have not arrived at perfect soundness of mind. Indeed, I never shall arrive at it. I compound palliatives rather than remedies for my gout, and am satisfied if it comes at rarer interval and does not shoot so painfully. Compared with your feet, which are lame, I am a racer. Staring down my fortieth birthday, in a process which may or may not have been a midlife crisis, I realised that I really needed a philosophy of life. I grew up in a nice Christian church, but stopped believing in God in high school. I was an angry atheist for a while after that, but then I got a little older and realised that, without the structure of school or religion, I didn't have anywhere to make friends or feel like I belonged. So I mellowed out and got involved with a few secular organisations, but never really found the community I was looking for. Over time, it became clear that my search was deeper than just a quest for community. I was grappling with existential questions, confronting nihilism, meaninglessness, and the inevitability of my own pain and death. At that point, Stoicism seemed like the next best thing to try. I think it is hard to live without a philosophy of life. It makes it hard to know if you are a good person, and it makes it hard to know if you are living your life well. It makes it difficult to feel connected to the people around you and in the world, and it leaves you without an answer when that voice in the night whispers that life is meaningless, you are going to die, and all your suffering has been for nothing. Earlier in my life, I struggled with depression and panic attacks, starting in childhood and lasting until about the age of 30, when I finally found relief through the combination of mindfulness meditation and cognitive behavioural therapy. After the fact, I realised that both these things turned out to be fundamental parts of Stoicism. Mindfulness, the ability to focus on the present moment, and CBT, which is effectively the systematised application of the dichotomy of control, which was inspired by Epictetus's quote, It is not the things themselves that disturb men, but their judgments about these things. Finding myself, a decade later, returning again to this same wellspring of wisdom sparked a question in me. Could the broader claims of Stoicism actually be true? Could a life dedicated to virtue really be the path to true happiness? Could tranquility of mind be real? Either way, I had to know. I think of Stoicism as a lost art. Well-functioning philosophies of life, like the major world religions, are highly complicated social machines. They provide many priceless goods, which we are mostly unable to attain on our own. They contextualise existence in ways which allow for the experience of meaning and purpose in life. They provide moral frameworks which allow us to build community and associate with others in ways which promote social harmony. They give us answers about death, which give us the strength to face our own personal annihilation. And they channel the wholesome and benevolent parts of our natures so we can help others in the right way and at the right time. Stoicism, if it is going to live up to its promises, must provide the same. It might have, if we were students of the original school, listening to lectures under the Stoa and immersed in the culture of ancient Athens. Then, we would have contemporary moral exemplars to inspire us, Stoic teachers with decades of experience, and many fellow students, both more and less experienced, to learn from. What we have now is a short stack of original books, our very strange modern world, and an intuition that this philosophy is true. So it is up to us, as inheritors of these ideas, as students of Seneca, Epictetus or Marcus Aurelius, to figure out how this philosophy works in a deep way, 
so its full potential to bring peace and tranquility to people's lives can be fulfilled. There is a tendency in our era to approach philosophies of life a la carte. We try to adopt the parts we like without the ones which seem unnecessary or unkind, but without a deep understanding of how all the parts work, we usually end up with world views that are superficial or which fail us at the times when we need them most. Some of the parts we dislike turn out to be crucial for the functioning of the philosophy or are needed only in the times of the greatest struggle. We are better served by taking the opposite approach, especially with Stoicism. We need to act as if Stoicism were true in order to find out if it actually is. Once we understand it fully and know how all its parts work, then we can pick and choose but until then we ought to try to accept it as a whole. In my life, so far, Stoicism seems to be living up to its promises. I have not tamed most of my fears and desires, but I have made real progress on some of them, much more than I ever thought possible. It gives me reason to think the system described by Seneca might actually work. At this point, I think chances are high enough that it will, to justify spending a few more years working really hard at it just to find out one way or the other. That being said, Stoicism is not something you learn overnight. It takes a sustained effort, making real changes to your thoughts and actions over a long period of time. Even with a lifetime of commitment, most of us will never reach perfect tranquility of mind but the progress we should be able to make will put us far beyond the average person. The Levels of Stoicism Stoicism sets some lofty goals for its adherents, but is also practical about the depths from which we set out and the limited progress we are likely to make. It is a long road, and the highest ranks are reserved for those gifted with a natural disposition or those who started their diligent training in their youths. But the progress which the rest of us can make is more than we can imagine at the start. For the last few years I have been learning Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, a modern martial art which can be thought of as a combination of Judo and wrestling, with the addition of chokes and joint locks. There is no punching or kicking allowed, but other than that it is full speed and full contact. It has been similar to the process of learning Stoicism in a number of ways. First off, it's really hard, especially at the start. You need to unlearn many bad habits and learn to react in a bunch of new and tricky ways. They take a lot of practice, and it is a long process before the parts of the system come into focus together. All the parts need to be practiced and understood on their own and then merged together into a personal style, the specific way you practice Stoicism or Jiu-Jitsu. First, you spend a long time learning all the techniques. Then you spend a long time focusing on the ones which work best for you and become an expert at them. They both take some trust in the system at the beginning because you cannot see your destination from where you start. You might not even be able to see the first rest stop. Also with both, it takes considerable time and effort before you even realise how bad you are, and you need to learn how to suck for a long time before you get any good. Both get rewarding and fun in their own way after that, though. There is a saying in Jiu-Jitsu that you spend the first year learning to win 99% of the fights and the next 20 years training to win the last 1% which fits Stoicism well if you think of that last 1% as your own mortality. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu also has a belt system, which indicates the wearer's skill level, which could easily work for Stoicism. Seneca outlines an equivalent system of three classes to rank those who have made some progress in their practice, but who have not yet achieved the level of Stoic Sage. You reply, what, are there no degrees of happiness below your happy man? Is there a sheer descent immediately below wisdom? I think not. 
For though he who makes progress is still numbered with the fools, yet he is separated from them by a long interval. Among the very persons who are making progress, there are also great spaces intervening. They fall into three classes, as certain philosophers believe. First come those who have not yet attained wisdom, but have already gained a place nearby. Yet even that which is not far away is still outside. These, if you ask me, are men who have already laid aside all passions and vices, who have learned what things are to be embraced, but their assurance is not yet tested. They have not yet put their good into practice, yet from now on they cannot slip back into the faults which they have escaped. They have already arrived at a point from which there is no slipping back, but they are not yet aware of the fact. As I remember writing in another letter, they are ignorant of their knowledge. It has now been vouchsafed to them to enjoy their good, but not yet to be sure of it. Some define this class, of which I have been speaking, a class of men who are making progress, as having escaped the diseases of the mind, but not yet the passions, and are still standing upon slippery ground, because no one is beyond the dangers of evil, except him who has cleared himself of it wholly. But no one has so cleared himself, except the man who has adopted wisdom in its stead. The second class is composed of those who have laid aside both the greatest ills of the mind and its passions, but yet are not in assured possession of immunity, for they can still slip back into their former state. The third class are beyond the reach of many of the vices, and particularly of the great vices, but not beyond the reach of all. They have escaped avarice, for example, but still feel anger. They no longer are troubled by lust, but are still troubled by ambition. They no longer have desire, but they still have fear. And just because they fear, although they are strong enough to withstand certain things, there are certain things to which they yield. They scorn death, but are in terror of pain. Let us reflect a moment on this topic. It will be well with us if we are admitted to this class. The second stage is gained by great good fortune with regard to our natural gifts, and by great and unceasing application to study. But not even the third type is to be despised. Think of the host of evils which you see about you. Behold how there is no crime that is not exemplified, how far wickedness advances every day, and how prevalent are sins in home and commonwealth. You will see, therefore, that we are making a considerable gain if we are not numbered among the basest. In jiu-jitsu, players usually spend around two years at white belt, the trainee level, before moving up to the proficient level, blue belt. Blue belt is Seneca's third type. With many more years of training, some players are then able to move up to purple, brown and black belts, corresponding to the second and first types, and the Stoic Sage. Do not mess with black belts or sages. 90% of people who start jiu-jitsu give up before they make blue belt, and I bet that is a similar dropout rate as Stoicism. But if we could just stick it out and put in a couple years of hard work, we could change our whole lives. Most of us will never get beyond the third type, but even making it that far is covering most of the distance between heaven and hell. Stoic practice. Getting on the rhythm or walking the tightrope. When jarred unavoidably by circumstances, revert at once to yourself and don't lose the rhythm more than you can help. You'll have a better grasp of the harmony if you keep on going back to it. When practised by a proficient Stoic, the hours between waking up and going to bed all ought to have a similar emotional valence. There should be a routine to train the mind, with preparation in the morning and reflection in the evening. The time in between where our lives are lived should be committed to virtue and resisting the snares and enticements of fortune. Marcus Aurelius described this state as the rhythm. And when things are going well for me, it does feel like that, but most days practising stoicism feels more like walking on a tightrope. With a tightrope, you need to climb up to a high place before you can even start. Then you have to keep your balance for the whole day while fortune buffets you from all directions. 
When you inevitably lose your balance and fall, you have to get back on your feet, make the climb again and get back out on the rope. The goal is to make it all the way across, from your AM preparation to your PM reflection without falling. It seems like it is going to take a while. So, how do we actually do this? Your process may vary, but here is what mine looks like. Get on the tightrope. Wake up early. Meditate. Listen or read a little Stoicism. Write or be creative. Remember this in the morning and as often as I can throughout the day, that I could die today. Not even the next hour is guaranteed. I can only practice Stoicism in this moment. That Seneca is on my shoulder, observing my every thought and action, and rooting for my success. My connectivity to the people around me and in the world. Think of whoever comes to mind and make sure I'm in proper relation to them, especially people I'm annoyed at. Stay on the tightrope. As I go about my day, think about virtue and how I can practice it. How can I superstitiously worship her today? Being mindful in the moment, try to keep constant watch on my thoughts and dispute any irrational or harmful ones as soon as they enter my mind. The dichotomy of control, only set internal goals, be indifferent to things outside of my control. I almost always have less control than I think I do the benefits I've received and the gratitude I owe, how I can bestow benefit on other worthy people, other wholesome thoughts. For negative thoughts about the past or present, remember that nothing can be changed except for things in the future. Make sure all my energy is going towards that. Desires. Remember what is truly good, a mind that desires what it already has. Fears. Remember what is truly evil. A mind that gives in to its fears. Worries. Separate what is in your control and act on it. Practice indifference to the rest. At lunch, take 10 to 15 minutes to do a stoic journaling practice. In the evenings, exercise. Write or be creative or productive. Cook simple, healthy meals. Journal. What went well today and what did not? How could I have acted better? What bad habit of yours have you cured today? What vice have you checked? In what respect are you better? List the benefits I have received and why I'm grateful for them. Think of ways I can return them in the future. What was the best idea I encountered today? What is my Seneca's someone part for himself? Each day acquire something that will fortify you against poverty, against death, indeed against other misfortunes as well. And after you have run over many thoughts, select one to be thoroughly digested that day. This is my own custom. From the many things which I have read, I claim some one part for myself. Only time will reveal whether Stoicism fulfills its promises. The answer may only come to light when we face death and see if we can engage with it as equals. However, I can confirm that the moments spent practicing Stoicism, those moments when I remember my goal and focus my attention on wisdom, justice, temperance and courage, are time well spent. These moments are often my best, and even when challenging, they never overwhelm me. In fact, I believe there is truth in Seneca's words. The present alone can make no man wretched. It is difficult to practice the idea that living in the moment is the best approach to life, even when you intellectually understand that it is. We have some natural part of us that wants to live in the past or the future, but to truly prioritise the present moment is the ultimate expression of the dichotomy of control. It is challenging to comprehend this truth but the moment we truly see it, in a way that cannot be unseen, we probably become wise, in the Stoic sage sense of the word. I think this is probably a real epiphany that people can experience. 
It represents RT, true excellence in the application of our reasoning, and the result ought to be the most fulfilled state a human can experience. That last part is a hypothesis, but the ability to experience this state of mind seems true. The only way to find out is to keep practicing and trying to live every hour well.